If we navigate scores of virtual walls every day, firewalls, spyware, spam filters on our computers, automatic locking and alarm systems in cars, homes, office buildings, briefcases, passcodes everywhere, the spectacle of these actual walls remains distinctive. Their physicality makes them seem often like a literal throwback to another time, a time of fortresses and kings, militias and moats, gulfs and ghibellines, rather than a time of smart bombs, missile shields in space global warming, digital touchpads, and peoples and dangers so literally on the move, so radically miscegenated as to be no more containable by a physical land barrier than our air pollution or a new strain of influenza. <clears throat> Moreover, contemporary critical theory has attuned us to modalities of power radically at odds with either the symbolic or literal prophylactic of walls. We've learned, especially from the French, to keep our eyes on power's discursive operation, its non-centralized habitus, its non-commodifiable and physical dross. We're attuned to modern power's disciplinary or networked qualities, its rhizomatic irrigating or circulatory movements, its movement from below, its light and vaporous qualities. By contrast, walls appear to harken back to a power modality that's sovereign, spatially bounded, territorial, power that is material and centralized, exerted through overt force, fencing, and policing. But the relation of nation-state walls to checkpoints, viruses, and prophylaxes, to the dissemination of political power in networked bodies, is itself the first clue to the epidemic of wall building today. Far from defenses against invasions by other state powers, 21st century walls address non-state actors. They are not there to block the invasions of one nation state into another. They address non-state actors, what border experts have come to call clandestine trans transnational actors. They ad address individuals, groups, and mass population movements who may be responding to war, ethnic persecution, economic dislocation, and desperation or other incitations. The dangers that walls are figured as intercepting today are not only that of the would-be suicide bomber, but mass immigration. Not only overt violence to the nation, but imagined dilution of national identity through transformed ethnicized or racial demographics. Not mere illegal entrance, but unsustainable pressure on national economies that have ceased to be national, or on welfare states that have largely abandoned substantive welfare functions. As such, the new walls defend an inside against an outside in which these terms are not fixed by nation state identity or fealty, in which otherness and difference are often detached from jurisdiction and membership. They articulate an inside-outside distinction in which what is being kept out is neither other states nor even other citizens, indeed in which the subjects and political powers and violences that are being kept out are often territorially detached from states and sovereignty on both sides. Put a little differently, the new walls respond in part to a permanent lawlessness, lapping the edges and streaming across nation states, a continuous contestation of nation state sovereignty being met by intensified police and military, that is, exceptional measures as opposed to normal legal measures. Rather than emanating from the sovereignty of nation states then, these walls signal the loss of nation state sovereignty's a priori conceptual status, its easy link with legal authority, unity, and settled jurisdiction. You can see this sovereign failure as well in the way that the new walls codify the conflicts that they respond to as permanent and unwinnable, the way they permanently militarize such conflicts. And it's apparent in the fact that many of the new walls do not merely bound but invent the societies they limb. The consociations and divisions that they mark at times correspond to certain state interests, but they cannot always be precisely identified with settled sovereigns or nation states. The wall at the southern border of the U.S., for example, divides it not just from Mexico, but from the whole of the southern hemisphere. The walls of Spanish Morocco are blockading all of Africa from a point of entry into Europe. And the Israeli wall marks neither two states nor one, nor is it a self-consistent bid for either. 
just as the walls of apartheid and post-apartheid South Africa or the peace lines striating Belfast and Derry aim not, neither to divide nor unite those cities or Ireland. These walls, in other words, are monuments to unsettled and unsecured sovereignty, to post-national constellations. They are regulatory and control technologies at best for coping with a condition that simultaneously institutionalizes this condition and hence institutionalizes contested sovereignty. So, in short, rather than signs of sovereignty, the new walls appear as a symptom of its erosion. And if they stand for a contingent decisionism that exceeds law, it is a local and dispersed decisionism that often detaches from the state and further disseminates state power, hence further weakening the link between the state and sovereignty. That is, if walls are in part weapons against a permanent enmity or illegality, both at the boundaries of nation states and coursing through them, if they are among the new technologies of power, responding to the limitations or even breakdown of the rule of law in sovereign nations, they are continuous with the extra juridical practices springing up everywhere, from those concerning enemy non-combatants or renditions to those that permit the building of the Israeli wall in Palestinian territory, despite verdicts against its current route delivered both by the International Court of Justice and by the Israeli Supreme Court. This extra juridicism pertains not just to wall building that substitutes for law, it pertains as well, as we shall see, to the blurring of military, police, and citizen prerogatives at the sight of walls, a blurring that challenges not just the juridicism but the monopoly of violence often understood to anchor nation-state sovereignty. A concrete instance of this blurring of police, military, and citizen prerogatives and of the, of the dilution of the monopoly of violence often understood to secure or anchor state sovereignty appears in a, in a recent construction of a very small piece of the border wall in Arizona, um, in, in, of the U.S.-Mexico border wall, by a group called the Minutemen, who are a well-known and well-organized U.S. vigilante group that has assigned itself the task of blocking illegal immigrant entry across the southern border of the U.S. On private property in a small town 75 miles east of a secured port of entry, the Minutemen themselves undertook the funding the design, and the building of a mile-long barrier. They constructed the barrier out of 15-foot-high heavy-gauge welding mesh that can neither be climbed nor cut with conventional saws or wire cutters. Why did they do it? Well, in part, this endeavor seemed aimed at showing an inept and inefficient Department of Homeland Security how to do its work. That is, the Minutemen are among those extremely frustrated with the slow and ineffective building of the U.S.-Mexico wall. The first start on the wall um, was really pretty comic. It was built out of remaindered uh, uh, landing strips from the Vietnam War, which, when used as a... Um, as, as pieces of wall turned out to have the perfect corrugation for just climbing up like a set of steps and hopping over. Um, several hundred miles of wall were built out of that material. Then there's tunneling, then there's all kinds of lawsuits against the building of the wall that stop it at various times for ecological or Native American or other reasons. So in part, the endeavor of, of building walls, a piece of the wall with their own funds and their own enter, uh, 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 work and their own land seemed aimed at showing the state how to do its work. And in this regard, it seems to express a certain anti-statism or at least a disdain toward the bureaucratic and legal weightedness of liberal democratic states. But the Minutemen, of course, don't merely deride. They also aim to shore up state power. And what's more, it turns out the state is a willing partner with this vigilante group. Significantly, atop the fence that the Minutemen built on their own, this group mounted video cameras for spotting illegal immigrants and streamed these cameras directly to the dispatch offices of the U.S. Border Patrol. So what you